Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you here uh, to the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy for this event in, uh, in partnership with the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society. I'm Peter Lowen. I have the great pleasure of being the director of the Monk School and also being the associate director at SRI. So uh, it's a bit of a two-for-one deal today. Um, but all, all, all I want to do is just uh, say what a pleasure it is to have uh, this wonderful event and have you all here to talk about this important book, uh, this interesting book, and this timely book. Uh, the person who's going to discuss the book will introduce her more formally. I just want to uh, note, uh, it says University of British Columbia underneath it, but uh, it's Wendy Wong, who a long, was a long-time colleague and is still a colleague here at the University of Toronto, and we're really pleased to have her here uh, with us. Uh, she's a wonderful friend and colleague and an extremely uh, 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 insightful person um, uh, who's written a really important book. So, Wendy, it's really great to have you here. I'm going to just acknowledge the land on which University of Toronto operates. It has, for thousands of years, been the land of the Seneca... Uh, the Huron-Wendat and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. We're rightfully lucky to be able to work and to live and to play and to thrive on this land. And it's something we should always keep in front of mind. Um, and now I just want to ask you to put your hands together for a very special person. Monique Critchlow is the Executive Director of the Schwartz Reisman Institute. She keeps that incredible institution going with a really wonderful team that I have a pleasure of working with. Um, and I want you to, uh, to welcome her to the podium here at the Monk School. Monique. Thanks, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Minnie Critchlow, and I'm the Executive Director of the schwartz Reisman Institute uh, for Technology and Society. And as Peter said, we're really grateful to host this event in collaboration with our friends at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Um, so welcome to everyone, and thank you for coming out on this Friday afternoon. We're here not to celebrate um, only the launch of a fantastic new book, um, about which I'll say more sh shortly, but also to catch up with friends and colleagues while making new connections to strengthen the networks of a rapidly growing community, and to engage in some fascinating conversation about crucial topics at the intersection of technology and society. Um, Peter's land acknowledgement reminds us that there are people all over the world that are tirelessly fighting for their rights every day. So it's fitting that we have with us today two brilliant scholars who are experts in human rights. Wendy Wong is the author of We the Data, we, we the Data Human Rights in the Digital Age the book we're here to celebrate today. Wendy is also a professor of political science and principal research chair at the University of British Columbia. Before moving to BC, Wendy was a professor here at University of Toronto, where she was also an affiliated researcher at the Monk School and one of the inaugural research leads here at the schwartz Reisman Institute. Wendy's being here today is definitely a homecoming story. Wendy's work as an international relations scholar focuses on global issues dealing with human rights, and particularly the dynamics of collective action, issues she explores at length in her book. Wendy's job as a research lead at schwartz Reisman was to steer the directions of inquiry that the Institute took on in its early days. Our crucial focus on gathering great minds from diverse areas of inquiry was reflected in Wendy's development of this book during her time at SRI. The Institute is very proud to have played a role in supporting and influencing this important new work. Congratulations, Wendy. Next to Wendy, we are joined by one of SRI's current research leads, Anna Sue. Anna is, a, is an associate professor at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law, where she specializes in international human rights law and the relationship between technology and international law. Anna's expertise in these areas, combined with her leadership role at the schwartz Reisman Institute, make her an ideal discussant to lead us through an exploration of Wendy's book today. And before I hand it over to Anna, let me say a few words about why this book is so important in this moment. Much of my own career has focused on understanding information challenges. How do, how do people use and understand technology? How do we make sense of folks or who are benefiting, how do we make sure folks are benefiting from technology? And I think that's an important vision that I share with SRI, and one of the reasons I'm proud to be leading the institute alongside the ac academic leaders like Peter and, and Anna and Jillian Hatfield. I think all of our institute's affiliate researchers are in some way concerned with what could broadly be termed information challenges. And I really think Wendy's book couldn't come at a better time as we face some of the more potent and large-scale information challenges in history. The rise of big data and the increasingly influential role of tech companies in democracy and public life are things that we all need to be thinking about. So I'm very excited for this conversation today. 
let me tell you a bit about what to expect. Anna will kick things off for us, introducing Wendy and the, Wendy's book and giving us a, a few of her own brief reflections on it. Anna and Wendy will then have a conversation about some of the key issues in the book until about quarter to five. Um, at that point, we'll open it up for questions from the audience for about 30 minutes or so, and Anna will, will moderate questions during that period. If you'd like to ask a question, please place your hand up and wait until a microphone's brought to you. Someone on the team can bring you a microphone. Um, and then after we're done with the question and answer, we'll, we'll um, join everyone in the foyer for a reception. We haven't programmed official breaks, so if you just need to use the washroom or grab a drink of water, just feel free to exit the room quietly. Um, please note that while today's event is not being broadcast live, it is being recorded and will be posted online at a later date. If you haven't already purchased a book with your event admission and would like to do so, you can visit the registration table directly outside the doors and staff can help you with um, how to buy that. And with that, let's get started. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Anna Sue. Oh, wow. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. I mean, this is a very rainy Friday afternoon, so um, I guess it speaks to the timeliness and the importance of this topic. But before I um, kick off our discussion, I think uh, I just want to give some, sp I'm very happy to be here, uh, especially to welcome back uh, Wendy here in Toronto and to the SRI community, and I think she has a few words to share. Yeah, I mean, it's so lovely to be here with you on this gray day um, to talk about some, I think, really important issues. And it's so nice to see everyone here. And as we've been saying, I mean, SRI really was a catalyst for this project. And without Jillian Hadfield's support and the rest of the SRI community, including my fellow inaugural research leads, some of whom are here today, I just, I really benefited incredibly from the gathering of people in this room. And I just want to really acknowledge that. Um, I would have never met Anna, although we just met today, but virtually we met years ago now um, through SRI and um, also the, the wonderfully supportive staff who have put this amazing event together. Thank you so much. And all, I want to thank all of my U of T colleagues, I, you know, those at the Monk School and also in the Department of Political Science. I started my career here, um, which now feels like a long time ago, but it's so lovely to see so many of you here and, and new friends who have who've come to, to listen about the book. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, so um, I guess um, it's uh, you know as evidenced by the uh, by the by the interest and the time when uh, this book, as we know, is quite timely and important. And just so I don't want to assume that everybody here has read the book, you should buy the book. Uh, it's available outside. Um, but for just to put everybody on the same page, I think uh, what this in this book, like Wendy, does a really good job, like sketching uh, and showing this so-called phenomenon of datafication, that is this phenomenon of basically transforming aspects of ourselves into quantifiable or computable data, right? And, um, and, she, in order, and she shows that, in order to show that, in order to understand this phenomenon, she's, um, she, she discusses this, uh, she shows the distinctive characteristics of data, uh, particularly uh, the nature of data that it's um, that it's social, that it's co-created, meaning that data is not just about us, not, not just, that it does not belong to ourselves alone, uh, that data is forever or sticky, uh, that it practically lasts forever, and, um, and uh, the, the idea that data is um, uh, linked. Linked. Yeah. What? Linked. Are you doing the characteristics? Yes. Yeah, they're linked. They're linked. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it was so much. Uh, there's, it's such a rich book. I mean, I learned so much reading from it, especially because this is not, um, I, I know more about the human rights side rather than data side. But uh, yeah. So uh, given these characteristics of data, you know, um, uh, may, perhaps this is a good point to like uh, kick off this discussion by um, by asking Wendy like what do you think is the uh, what does the human rights lens or what does the human rights framework uh, bring uh, to the table in terms of understanding this phenomenon of datafication? Why is it important to understand it as no. a human rights issue? So I came to this project um, right before the pandemic started, and I think at the time a lot of the ways that people were talking about AI um, was from a very technical perspective, and also about what we could do with AI and the phenomenon. So 
What, what can AI do to make our lives better? And I felt like what was really missing from that conversation was, well, what are the social and political changes? Because yeah. they were on the, on the one hand saying, this is fundamentally going to change our lives. And on the other hand, not really acknowledging the sort of negative or at least disruptive ramifications of, of data um, and AI. And so, so I think I, I came to this thinking, OK, from a political science lens, from a social science lens, what are the social and political ramifications of the changing of, or the, the sort of datafication of human life, taking human behaviors and thoughts and creating binary data out of them. So what is the effect of allowing computers to read all these data and analyze all these data about what, how we're living life? And with that, because of my background in, I, you know, I study global governance, I've looked at human rights for a very long time, and actually a lot of my early research was on NGOs, on non-governmental organizations. So I thought about civil society and collective action for a long time. And one of the things that really occurred to me was if life is fundamentally going to change, that means the human experience is fundamentally going to change, but are we going to put in place the safeguards that we have created since 1948 to sort of preserve the human potential, or to, to encourage human potential and really allow people to at least strive for a minimal human existence, given the way that data have fundamentally changed our lives. So how, how are they doing that? And what does human rights have to say about it? And at the time, there was a lot of talk about privacy. And we actually talked about this earlier. Lots of talk about privacy, lots of talk about surveillance and freedom of expression. But of course, those of us who work on human rights know that's just a handful of the many dozens of rights that actually exist out there um, in the world for all of us to claim. And so the question for me was, well, how do we think about this um, in a more inclusive way to really think about the whole human experience, not just um, these small parts that, that um, people were really concentrating on? So I think the human rights view is one that really investigates perhaps more deeply into some of the basic values that are going to fundamentally change because of datafication and AI, and in fact have changed. So the four values I, I focus on in the book, I actually have a slide for this, but we're sort of going out of order. That's OK. Let me just advance. Um, what I really focused on was the values that undergird our human, what we understand as human rights. So this is uh, what's called Rene Cassin's Portico. This comes from 1948. This is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the touchstone for anyone working on human rights today. This is an international agreement that all the countries in the world at the time acceded to. Um, they agreed that these are the values they were going to try to, to protect. And you know the, the portico part's really important. It's all the different articles that were present in the, in the, in the Universal Declaration. But I focused on the, the basis for that set of rights that were declared, because of course, there are fundamental values undergirding human rights, because human rights is not a it's sort of a living set of values, right? We don't, we don't just stop or, or we think about, you know, how have different things how have different advances in our way of living changed or affected things like privacy? Well, we have to go back to thinking about these basic values. What are we actually trying to protect with human rights? And I think that's what the book's about. It's about the fact that things like equality and dignity and um, what I call autonomy, but it's, it's liberty here, but I think autonomy is less of a loaded term in our, in, our, um, in our political system now, and the idea of community. Right. It's called brotherhood here, but I think I could update it to be less gendered. Um, the idea that we, as human beings, are trying, the values that we have that are universal are dignity, um, autonomy, equality, and community. And those are the things that we should be really focusing on when we think about the effects of datafication. Right. Um, so I wanted to, because uh, one of the things that um, I noted uh, from reading the book is that uh, you know that, that there seems to be a mismatch between um, like uh, how um, the uh, the there seems to be a mismatch between the challenges posed by datafication. So in the in the book, uh, these case studies included facial recognition technology, uh, digital uh, or virtual immortality. Um, but on the other hand, the existing regulatory frameworks uh, seems to be inadequate. To, um, to address really the full spectrum of these challenges. And I'm just wondering how do you, because at the very end of the book, um, the proposal is that we should um, 
come up, we should recognize something like a right to data literacy, which I'll get back to, I'll, I'll press you more in more detail later, but how do you reconcile, um, what do we get out of it? Uh, that you know, that we're, we seem to be going back to the basics of human rights in order to meet the challenges posed by these events. But um, I just wanted to see like, what, were, what was your thought process like uh, in arriving at that outcome? Well, and I think this is an important question because one of the things that I, you know, came back at me very early on in this project was, well, if human rights don't apply very well anymore, then why should we have them? <laughs> so, right? Like, maybe we just don't need them. And also, you know, you, you, when you work in human rights, you often get the comment, well, they don't work that well anyway because right. we see a lot of violations, yeah. which, we, which right. we have an answer to, right? It's yes. that all law has violators of it, but that doesn't mean that you know the laws against murder shouldn't exist, right? Okay, so let's bracket that. Um, so, yeah. so I think this goes back to what, how you started this uh, conversation. So let me go back. This this idea of data stickiness. I think it. it yeah. What I really thought about when I was writing this book was how it is that the what what is it about data that make it hard for us to realize those four values? So dignity, equality, community, and autonomy. And I came to the conclusion it's because data are sticky, right? So we tend to think digital data are fantastic. They're great because they're easily copy, copied and transferable, which I agree. Those are, that's the winning combination for why digital data have become so prevalent. But that also has some human rights implications and there are human rights implications beyond this transferability. Like, so what is it that makes it hard for us to, to realize rights like, like uh, you know, our freedom of expression? Why is the freedom of expression different now than it was 20 years ago before AI and big data? So I came up with, the, up with this idea of data stickiness because I think that what makes digital data very challenging from a human rights perspective is that they actually stick on you, kind of like gum at the bottom of your shoe, which is like, you know, we all step on it and then we realize we have the gum on our shoe and it's really hard to take off, right? So that's the idea. Um, so sort of behind that analogy, and there are four reasons why data are sticky beyond this easily transferable and um, replicable idea is that they're about mundane things. So one of the things that really became clear, especially when I was writing this during the pandemic, is that we're so, digital technologies are so integrated in our lives and they are so data intensive. So any app you use is picking up tons and tons of data about you, about the way you use the app, about the way you use the device on which that app is, about how you know your patterns of, of use going back a long time, yeah. right? So each time you engage, you're, you're doing things that are being recorded. And these are not really remarkable things. They're sort of everyday things. Like think about how you use your phone, right? Or you know, some of you are using your phones right now. Think about how you're using it. You're using them as everyday devices. And so it's not like you can avoid these things. A lot of the data that are being tracked are you know, biometric in nature. It's not like, I mean, you could change your face, but it's really difficult to do that. And so, and your face is not remarkable, right? In the sense that you use it every day. And so that, the mundaneness of, of what's being datafied was really stuck out to me. The other, the other characteristics is that, okay, so once those data are collected, they're actually put in data sets that are traded, bought and sold you know, around the world. So it's not like you make, the data are made and they just stay really neatly in some Excel spreadsheet on someone's computer. It's, it's that they, they could be potentially linked to all sorts of other data. And in fact, that's what gives the data value, especially for AI systems, right? It's the capacity to find patterns in big, big pools of data. And because of this, and, and sort of as an extension of this, data once created are as good as forever. They're fundamentally immortal because we don't know where they're going. So we have no idea who's using those data. And so you just have to sort of assume that once they're made, they're just gone, right? They're out there in the world. Um, and finally, I think what makes data really kind of sticky too, and this is a, I think this is a concept that I, I spent a lot of time thinking through, especially from a human rights perspective, especially because people talk about my data or your data, but that doesn't actually fit with how data are created. And so you think about how do data about people's activities get created? Well, one, somebody has to be doing something. Let's say you type something into a search bar, but there has to be someone who is interested in actually taking those data, right? So data are co-created between a data source, that's basically all of us, and a data collector, which is often a company these days. Sometimes not, most often a company. And so if you have no data source or no data collector, you don't have any data. 
So data are only created as a sort of collaboration between data sources and data collectors. And so they're co-created. So whose data are they? Right? Are they yours because they're about you? Or are they theirs because they chose to make those data? And I think that's a real fundamental concern. And the other part of co-creation is the, the recognition that the data that are being collected about all of us are not significant on their own. They're only significant in combination with other people's data. Because AI systems are designed to make predictions about things like you, people like you, right? So we get clumped into these collectives that are not our, of our own creation. And often we don't choose whether the data are being uh, created. Think about when people post pictures of you on social media. Not all of us even know or consent about that. I think it's become pretty common not to ask folks. Or you know, in the book, I talk about 23andMe, an incredibly popular kit that people gift their family members at Christmas, which if you're the receiver of the 23andMe kit uses said kit, it has implications for everyone related to that person. And no, no other family members really have to get involved with that data collection. And that data also is now being stored by a, a corporation, right? So. <laughs> I wasn't, think these are the reasons why. why wasn't data there a data matter. breach recently about uh, in, involving 23andMe? Yeah. Um, that basically they come up with this list involving Ashkenazi Jews, and now it's being sold in the black market or something. Well, and it's a real problem because companies like 23andMe, I mean, not to get too far in the weeds, but they are not held accountable in the same way as a health professional, right? There are different codes yeah. of, uh, different standards of legal. Uh, legal standards for your doctor who holds your medical records, excuse me, medical records versus a 23andMe, which is not a health company and therefore doesn't have those obligations in the same way. Yeah, I mean, I guess just to, you know, just to really make it more concrete, like this, um, the challenges posed by datafication, one of the things that you do in the book, uh, which I found really um, um, which I found really fascinating because I've never seen, I've never seen uh, something like that used in a regular nonfiction is the use of this um, like fictional family and uh, with the last name of made up, right? Um, My made to, ups. to indicate their made up nature. But it's a family of four. Um, you have, uh, who is it? Is it um, Jack and Claire? I've got uh, Jason and Claire. The Jason parents. and Claire, Jack and Corey, the Jack twins, and Corey, yep. right? And in, in, the, uh, in, in, a, in the book, which I thought was, you know, it's a clever way of like really driving down, driving home the importance of, uh, or driving home the challenges posed by this phenomenon is that um, whatever, like each family member encounters their own challenge uh, that is a result of this datification. So for example, as a result of the oversharing of the dad, Jason, um, his, uh, his, um, his son, who's one of the twins, ends up getting an email about their adoption origins. And so I'm just wondering, like, what made you decide to, uh, um, you know, come up with this narrative device? And uh, what do you think are the benefits and drawbacks from it? So, yeah, I, I really like the made-ups. I'm glad you like the made-ups. Some people don't like the made-ups. Um, and it was a really nice way to write a book because in academic publishing, as you pointed out, yeah. we don't get to make too many things up. In fact, we yeah. try to resist that. Um, so as a way, because this book was written for a general audience, um, one of the things my early, um, an editor looking at the manuscript was, you have a lot of examples. They're really well backed up, but they're not really speaking, right? They're just kind of uh, examples. Okay. And I thought, yeah. okay. And she's like, why are you including all these examples? And I'm like, well, I'm a little anxious about some of these things, but also in the process of writing this book, I've sort of taken in like other people's anxieties, like when you talk to them about what they're worried about, you know. So, so it ended up being a composite of my own anxieties, other people's anxieties, things I was reading in the news that I thought was were you know interesting, and I wanted a way to really normalize this situation because it is normal for many of us. We are dependent on, on digital media. We are dependent on devices that use AI to give us outputs that we find useful. You know, like thinking about things as mundane as, as autocorrect, right? So on your phone. And so I really thought it was useful to use them as a device 
And I think it made it more readable in the end. Um, but like, I think one of the things that really also helped me as a writer was to be able to say, like, okay, well, this is based on some reality. But actually, you know, there, so most of the anecdotes are based on something that actually happened in the world. But then I sort of backfill it because, of course, our lives are not just about the news events. And they happen in context. And often people are making really either split-second decisions or not well-thought-out decisions, not because they're not smart or incapable, but because these technologies are so new. It's actually hard for us to anticipate what could possibly happen if we, you know, like a lot of times you hear, oh, well, who cares if they have my purchasing data, right? right. I mean, who, it's just a recommender algorithm that tells me what else to buy next time. Well, sometimes it does matter, right? Because data are linked, because they're, they're essentially forever, that we do, there are situations where the data come back to, to get us, so to speak, in ways that we don't expect. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, well, yeah, for me, it was really effective because then you can see how it actually affects real people. And, you know, then the, this, this made up family, this fictional family becomes like a stand in for our own, as you say, your, our own anxieties on this, right? Yeah, and we're all living through this in, in, in real time. Um, and a lot of stuff has already happened, right? A lot of data already be, have been created by it, uh, about us. They exist out in the world. And, and so this is really, I mean, one of the reasons I started writing this book in part was because I had two little kids in rapid succession. And this is at the time when a lot of people were sharing a lot about their kids, either unborn yes. or just born. Yeah. And I resisted that. And I, and I was trying to figure out why I was doing that. But ultimately, I think I had reservations that I hadn't put you, to words. You right? didn't post them on Instagram? I didn't post anything. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because yeah. I was uncomfortable. Yeah. And I couldn't figure out why until I finished the book, right? Oh, until yeah. I had the made ups. Then I kind of had a, a way to, to think that through. But it is, it's true. Real people, there are real situations where people are making decisions. And those decisions can have far-reaching ramifications. I mean, people who posted a lot of their kids, kids' pictures on Flickr, for example, inadvertently got their kids into facial recognition technology databases, right? And so, so that, and it happened, and it's not supposed to happen, but it did. And so you can't really take that back. Yeah, um, one of the chapters that um, yeah, you had, you do, you did have a, you do have a chapter there on facial recognition. But the one thing that I guess I found most fascinating was the one involving digital immortality. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask you about that because there's something we were talking about this earlier, about you know the creation, the use of data to um, resurrect ourselves, right? So that we would exist in some form even after death. And I was telling you that um, that it reminds me of uh, of an earlier episode of Black Mirror that I, I saw. But it turns out that Wendy here doesn't like Black Mirror because she finds it too scary <laughs> or creepy. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of those kinds of uh, of shows. And so one of the um, I, I'm just wondering, like, there's something about it that's. I'm sure everybody here in the audience would probably agree that there's something wrong about the creation because I'm pretty sure the technology of whatever it was at, it is at the moment, I'm pretty sure it's nothing close to what it would be like in the next few years, right? It's not close to anything mature at the moment, but it is there. As you say in the book, uh, there is now a huge industry involving digital afterlives, right? And um, and uh, for people here, digital immortality essentially, I mean, I'll leave Wendy to describe it in more detail, but I'm just wondering what do you think uh, is, uh, what, what sort of safe, safeguards or can we come up with uh, using the human rights framework to, um, I guess, address our uneasiness and our, uh, you know, just, we just feel that something's wrong with it, right? And so how can having a human rights uh, informed understanding of this issue, how can we, uh, how can we address that? I, it's because, I mean, the two chapters that really get people is either the facial recognition chapter or the, the di well, data and death is the chapter. It's a death chapter. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's not call it digital yeah. immortality. It's about what happens to data when you die. And so because data are as good as forever, they're immortal, right? The data are immortal. We are not, unfortunately, yet. Um, and so when you physically die, your data are still out there and could potentially be used either for general analysis or, as, as Anna pointed out, and this is what I found very macabre and yet <laughs> so fascinating when I was writing this book, is that there's, there's a huge 
industry, I believe there are a lot of players. I don't know how, actually how big it is in terms of monetary scale, but there's a lot, there are a lot of players in this industry trying to figure out how to use data to recreate at least a part of what people were are in life. And so this, so one of the one of the things is that I try to make this chapter not just about death, but it's also about life. Because we have to think about how the data out there that are about us have kind of a life of their own. So it's not just when you die, this is a problem. That actually could, you know, you could be recreated when you're still living. In fact, Carmelo Anthony and Jack Nicholas, among other people, have had their digital doubles created um, by some companies. And I think it really speaks to the four values of, of the human rights, um, the four human rights values that undergird this portico. I mean, I really think that the, the fact that people are curious about and, and eventually will be able to so-called so recreate people through data that have been produced by someone who's maybe now deceased goes against all of the values that, that I, I think um, justify our, our regime of, of human rights. And so there's no human right right now that would be violated yeah, if a digital exactly. immortal was created, right? I don't, there just isn't one. Right. Nor do I think we could actually articulate that very well. I don't know like the right to like an authentic self or something, but like that doesn't make it, I, I just don't know, right? It's sort of this gray area in that sense because we do think that how we live our lives and our sort of corporal lives are, they belong to us. But at the same time, we are making data uh, or data are being made about us in ways that we don't have a lot of control. So it feels very uncomfortable and we talked, it's, cr it's creepy. Does that make it a human rights issue? I think it does in that it pushes against human dignity. So dignity is really hard to define, but you know, in general, people think about it as the worth of someone, right? Someone's worth. If you treat someone with dignity, you're treating them as though they're worth something, right? And, and that they're not ends, they're not means to an end. They're actually ends in, ends in and of themselves. And so when, some, when data about someone are being used in ways that perhaps they either didn't authorize or didn't actually do themselves, but some algorithm is doing on their behalf, using data about them, that sort of pushes against what it means, the, the, should we treat data about someone as, as a commodity, as something that can be just run through an algorithm? Does that speak to dignity issues? It speaks to autonomy issues. It, some people, so there are a lot of examples from the book of people who, who have been created, recreated digitally after they die and they didn't consent to it, but it was possible. So one of the, one of the uh, examples I like to use is um, a young tech entrepreneur named Roman Mazarenko, he died in a, an unfortunate accident and one of his friends who really missed him actually gathered a bunch of texts that they had exchanged and then asked friends and family if they wanted to participate and then recreated Roman through a chatbot. And so, so they were able to keep texting Roman even though Roman had died. Uh, and, and the bot would respond in, in Roman's voice. And if you look at some of the content of those texts, they're pretty, I mean, they're pretty spot on, right? right. It's a well-written yeah. algorithm. Um, you know, so it's sort of, set, like, would Roman have wanted that? We don't, we don't know, right? So that's an, uh, that's a, th you know, uh, it affects autonomy. I think it also speaks to how we think about human communities in the sense that we've come to understand for a long time that when you die, you're not in the community anymore, right? There's a sort of line between the living yeah. and the dead. When you have all these virtual, if you had all these virtual um, people who are not physically with us anymore, what does that mean about who belongs in the human community? And this is a real question, again, I think for, for human rights, but we don't have an answer to that because we've never really encountered that. And then finally, there's just the whole point, cre creating a digital immortal of yourself is just a, another way that the, the haves can have something else that the have-nots can't. So they're, these are generally expensive things to do, and you know, there are all sorts of questions about whether what happens when software updates happen, what happens if data about someone get corrupted, you know, these sort of practical questions. But I think at the end of the day, it's also, well, who's going to be in this community? What types of people are going to be able to carry on in this digital immortal space? And it, 
again, is, a, is an equality question as well. Right. I mean, never mind legal questions. I, I right. think just this whole idea of having virtual uh, selves after death, I think it raises a lot of moral and ethical questions. Um, perhaps one way to connect it with the human rights framework is to say like, oh, you know, it's like having an advanced will of some sort that you can say like there should be no reproductions of me um, after my death. But then, yeah, I think uh, in reality, that's really only available to people who have the means to do that, right? Or um, who have the awareness to- Or the awareness, yeah, right. Yeah, like you have to really anticipate and so there's a, there have already been many people who have not anticipated this, right? Including Roman, my example, but there are others yeah. who simply the data have been around and so now people are starting to think about using the data in a certain way. Um, and so it really, yeah, there are some very vexing questions that really point to changes in the human experience, changes to what's possible. And it, Without human rights language, I don't think we have another universal framework that really focuses on, on human potential and sort of preserving some way for people to live their lives without you know, excessive suffering, for example. There's no other universal language of entitlements right, that really speaks to, to how people, if, they're, you know, if their potential is being stopped, to make claims against a, a to make claims against the state in most cases. Yeah, yeah no, I think, uh, I mean, if there's any takeaway from this, uh, from your book, I think, uh, I hope, uh, you know, that the main thing is that I think it should be more accessible for people to see these kinds of issues as a human rights issue and not just, you know, not just privacy, not just um, like taken in, in, taken in isolation. And one of the things that you point out in the latter, in the, I mean, I guess one of the main arguments of the book is that at the end of it, one of the proposals you have is to have this right to data literacy, right? And um, since moving to this country a few years ago, I'm a huge fan of libra public libraries, in particular the Toronto Public Library, because it gives you like a, a good third space, you know, public uh, space where you can bring your, uh, your children and everything is free and you don't have to spend money. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, but so I'm really like happy that you know libraries in your proposal have such a. I just want you to like uh, tell us a bit more about what does this right entail, like this right to data literacy. Yeah. So because data have become so integral and embedded in human life, I think, and and sort of in an active way, but also working in the background to affect different outcomes we have. Right? Yeah. So I, we haven't even talked about like how data inform fraud reporting or credit checks and other sorts of things. But you know, we're generating all these data. I think most of us in this room probably didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about data and how prevalent it would be in our lives, and, and especially digital data. Um, you know, some social scientists, we, we tend to think about the nature of data and how we make data in the process of research. But I, I think, in general, I wouldn't call myself a data expert either, only in the sense that, you know, I think when we think about literacy, we tend to think about reading and writing and arithmetic, right? That's basically what we're thinking about when we say, oh, someone's literate or not. That, which those skills, those functions enable individuals to participate within society, right? If you can't read and you can't write and you can't do basic arithmetic, it's, it's very difficult for, for people to function um, in, in modern societies. And I think, I think that this idea carries forward with data in that we can't make decisions anymore without really thinking about how the data generated around those decisions has different effects. And um, some of those are intended, some of those are unintended, and that's what I mean by data literacy, which is ab about being able to function, to be competent in society. I, I, would, I don't think that not thinking about data is a, is a is going to end up with, if you don't think about data, I think you're missing out on a whole bunch of things that, that are happening to you and around you. And so this is why I think, if anything, one of the ways we can think about how uh, you know, the human rights framework in terms of entitlements can go forward is that we should be able to demand of states and, and maybe even of, of corporations, so I think we can talk about that in a different question. Um, the, the, right to have the knowledge about how data are constructed, what data are, what data can do, 
and why it's important to know that these ch that data are created through choices, and those choices matter for the outputs that we get. Right? And these are, to think about data not just as numbers or zeros and ones, but to actually think about data as a process of taking observations and systematically recording them. I mean, that's really what data are. Right? And, and I think what we talked about earlier, the, the data being recorded are ever more granular, ever more mundane, and they you know, reflect specific things that data collectors want. But really, the process of creating data is as simple as saying, OK, well, you know, I want to count the number of leaves on every tree on campus, or I want to note how many red leaves there are in front of the monk school. <laughs> I, I, something mundane like that. You're creating right. data. You're taking phenomena that are observed, and you're making a systematic record. And humans have done that for a long time, ever since we figured out how to record things and, and pass them on. What's made it different now is that it's digitized, it's mundane, the data are sticky. But I think without having a sense of how important that shift is from analog data to digital data and then seeing the, the consequences of digital data in our lives, I don't think that we're going to be able to exercise our autonomy. I think that we will create huge swaths of inequality, which we already see, right? There are data experts in the world, you know, like data scientists, computer scientists, people working with big data. They're really good at thinking about all these things, um, about the implications of data. And most of us don't have that knowledge, that basic knowledge, much less expertise to be able to, to really take that on. And I don't think everyone should be a data expert, but I think we right. could be data literate. And how would libraries be um, like perform that role? You know, however humble but quite necessary. I don't. And, no, I think yeah. the library is, is fundamental, right? And, and so, so um, you know, you come up with this idea. Everyone has the right to data literacy. Well, how do you how do you realize that, right? So this is a hard, I think this is a, a long term cook. So literacy is not like a simple thing. And so, I think one of the things to to sort of take from the book is that. Our lives have changed really quickly in the past 15, 20 years, but the fix is, it's probably going to take just yeah. as long, right? It's not just going to be we're going to, you know, all use VPNs and everything's solved, right? So, so <laughs> libraries are super important, both university and, and public libraries, because they have the, they are the original data keepers. If you think about what librarians and libraries do, they collect data, so books or other means of the audio, video, data, archives. They sort that data, they put it nicely away in storage or on shelves, and they make it accessible, right? right. Which is, they're sort of, librarians are really like search engines, right? They, you go to the library, like, you know, as a kid, you go to the library, I need, I'm doing a report on marmots, and they know what to do, right? Right. Yeah. Before, before Google, right? Um, but they, they're serving that kind of function, and I think libraries are often, especially public libraries, are used to doing public outreach, you know, helping people who don't have the, the resources, who don't have um, maybe the skills to do things that they need to do, like apply for jobs on, on computers, right? And not everyone has a computer in order to do that, but most of us do need to apply for jobs. I think, so, so libraries already have such programming in place. In fact, right. Toronto Public Library yeah. was one of, when I was sort of doing the research on how libraries are, are working on literacy outside of reading and, and writing, um, lots of libraries are interested in things called digital literacy or data literacy right. or media literacy. And in fact, you could say that they've been doing that for a long time by providing computers, for example, right, public access. But the Toronto Public Library has actually been do, playing an active role in trying to provide programming, outreach programming, in fact, with SRI at times, to, to sort of provide public education on what is an algorithm. Why do algorithms matter? What is AI? How do I know if something's AI? And I think these are really important ways to, to make what sounds fancy and maybe scary very tractable for the public. Um, and, and similarly, university libraries often are doing research functions to figure out what is the best way to help people become more data literate, for example. But that's not the only way. So do, do you want me to talk about some of the other things that, I mean, that's oh, one sure, way. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, the other, the other thing we have to think about more, in, especially in this country, but every you know, democracy, I would say, is how we're teaching kids, K through 12, to work with data and really think 
in terms of data. And so some, I've talked to actually, it was, it's good to know in, in the US I was doing a talk and some students were saying, yeah, oh yeah, I had this one teacher who invested time to teach us about like media literacy, like how do you know misinformation from, from legitimate information? But it would seem very one-off and I think, you know, media literacy is great. It's part of understanding the general ecosystem of AI and data. And I think that we need, you know, to think about, every democracy needs to think about how we're going to prepare the next generations in the immersion of these technologies and in sort of the, the, the um, you know, the consequences of having all these different technologies in a political system where we are assigned with, you know, choosing our leaders, participating in policy making right. in times. So, so K through 12 education is really important and it's one of those areas where countries are gonna differ very greatly. Um, you know, the Canadian system is different from other systems in terms of who's delivering education and who's responsible for deciding educational policy. But you know, there are countries like Estonia that have really extensive digital literacy uh, resources for teachers and students. And, and, and kids are taught from a very early age all the way through their high school years how to think about data, think about um, different media, um, you know, the media ecosystem and what, what is you know, truth versus not truth. And I think in part they're motivated by their political system. They're 99% online in terms of government services and they've had problems with Russian mis misinformation for a long time. So Estonia has a good case, but they might be an outlier. I think we do need to think more about education and also higher education. So um, one of the things that I, I write about in the book and that this is really just starting, I mean, folks in this room are actually working on this, is really rethinking how technology fields are trained. Right? So it's not just yeah. all of us being data literate. It's also thinking, about how are computer scientists and, and engineers being taught about the consequences of their creations or what they potentially will create? And I think you know, ethics, ethics training is one thing. I think that's really important. But also in, in talking to some computer science colleagues in particular, like thinking about the types of training to, to, to broaden out training beyond technical skills to, yeah. to thinking about how the social sciences and humanities could at least expose you know, undergraduates and graduates to a broader, broader way of thinking, right? Even if they ultimately reject it, I mean, it's still there, right? It's yeah. still, it should be part of the, the education process. Yeah, actually, that's one of the things that I wanted to ask if uh, in terms of takeaway from the book, is there a different takeaway uh, that you would want to emphasize if we're talking about technology? Anybody who's, uh, who's involved in terms of creating the technology, say the engineers, the computer scientists, um, and anybody in that field, as opposed to you know, the general public, us, the consu general consumer of these, um, of these technologies? Right. Or is there like a baseline that's common to everyone and then you have these, uh, you know, what, what sort of like special takeaway, I guess this is what you already were talking about when you say like there should be these ethics part of the, of engineering cur curriculums, for example, right? Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I think, so I think one of the, the if I were to say what's the overarching goal of the book, right? Yeah. If you don't, if you don't want to get in the nitty gritty of human rights, you know, like, I think that's okay. What I'd like people to pick up on and, and really take away is to pause when we're making choices, right? Just to, so for, for the, the data subjects, right? Right. Um, we're, we're all used, I think we're, we're, I don't know if we're all used to this language, but certainly this is the way that we're all referred to in, in some of the writing about yeah. how AI works. We're all data subjects, right? We are the ones that are having data gathered about us. And we are subject to the, the whatever the terms and conditions of different um, data collectors. Yeah. I want us to stop thinking about ourselves as data subjects because in political science, being a subject is a position of inferiority, right? It, and, and in political systems, rather than be a subject, we want to be citizens, right? We want to take part. We want to have a stake. Unfortunately, man, the great many of us don't have the money to become shareholders in these companies, right? Or at least significant enough to actually change their minds. So, how else can we do this? I think we need to really think about ourselves as having a stake in the creation and analysis and, and storage of data 
and of AI, the systems of AI that are being created on the backs of AI, uh, on the backs of these, these large pools of data. I think we need to think about ourselves as stakeholders, as data stakeholders and not data subjects. And I think, you know, what's the, I think the power of words and self-identity really matters, right? If you're a stakeholder, it does mean that you have you have skin in the game. You have some reason to take part. And you know what what that means, you know, ultimately I think is what policymakers are, are trying to figure out right now. Um, how, how much companies can be regulated, how many rights we have to claim as individuals and as groups that are affected by data and have data gathered from us. But I think also what I was talking about in terms of training technology, the training that technology fields offer is, is if we can get folks who need a high degree of specialization to also be able to just think a little bit outside of that very technical training. I think it would create a bit of a pause for people working in these very large corporations, which is not right. going to change overnight, right? They, you know, I, I think that would be very idealistic. But it is to say that I actually think there are no, the people who I've talked to who've, who've also said, oh, I, you know, I work for a tech company and I, you know, this is the kind of reflection we have, but we don't have an opportunity to think about it or we don't have a right. systematic way to think these things through. And I think that's so unfortunate because these are the folks who are building the systems that then create social and political consequences for everyone. And if they knew a little bit about what that meant as they're writing code, I think that that would make these systems a bit better. And so this is, you know, this is about diversity, of course. People have talked a lot about that. But it's also just the type of training we offer in social science and humanities courses is this critical reflection. Yeah. And to be yeah. able to look outside yourself and to think about what you like about what, some, what someone's written, what you don't like about. I think that process is actually really useful when you're, when you're creating something new. So you're saying it's not yet too late. <laughs> I mean, because of the problem, this seems to be a big problem, just reading from the book, but at the same time, you seem to offer that, you know, this is not a, this is not a foregone conclusion, that we're, that we're subject to the, uh, to the whims of these technology companies, and that there is a way forward, right? Uh, that seems to be what I'm getting from the tenor of the, of the narrative. And so what would you probably, you know, just to, because we're also like towards the end of our time, I just want you to perhaps like, you know, what do you want to say to the people here who, you know, what would, what would be, what would be um, the main thing to do after reading your book? <laughs> or what would be the, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, phrase it that. I just mean that, you know, like how do, I mean, I guess just this reorientation of how they see themselves, um, like from the way that you were saying about instead of being a subject, now what does it mean to become a data stakeholder, uh, just being more informed in terms of how they share uh, different aspects of themselves, you know, like what do you think, what would be like, okay. you know, like, your uh, parting message uh, to the people here who are very privileged to hear you speak no, in person this is, about this book. No, yeah. I, sorry. I think you, you asked kind of, you started asking one question, I think, yeah. and then you changed it. I was like, oh, sorry. sorry. OK, what happened? OK, so I mean, I, I have so many questions. So <laughs> yeah, it's OK. I do too, right? After writing this book, I still have questions. I mean, one of the things that I think is really useful about a human rights framework is again that it's universal. It is a globalized political, accepted political and legal framework on which to hang mm -hmm. things that we might find uncomfortable, but we think should be part of the human experience. So protecting autonomy should be part of that, right? So right. that's what I found very valuable. And in terms of whether new rights will arise, well, I mean, some people think that there, there should be new rights, other people think that there shouldn't. I think this is important because there needs to be debate. And the reason why I don't think it's too late yeah, a ton of data has already been created about everyone in this room and everyone who's alive today who engages in, in uh, digital technologies. But, you know, as we know, data, data will keep going and keep getting gathered going forward if we don't stop how we think about or we don't change the way we think about data. And if we start thinking about the humanity in the data, yeah. which is also a way to sort of bring in the human rights, if we start thinking about data as coming from a human being, not as something to be sold and bought, but something that actually someone had to do right. in yeah. order to generate that data, making it valuable not just economically, but also socially and personally and culturally and politically, all the things politically. 
then we can st I think we can start thinking about, well, do we actually need those data? I mean, one of the things I really learned through the SRI community, actually, is how different social scientists and, and non-social scientists think about the world. Um, you know, we, we understand that, that data are scarce, right, because of the nature of what we study. But for, for technical fields, actually, data are just, there's so, me there's so much data, and we should just go get the data, right? And I, and I think, you know, that's not a knock on, on those fields at all, but it is an intensely different perspective on, on data because social scientists study people and, and computer scientists don't always do that, right? You're not always getting data about people. And when, when you are getting data about people, that is very different from getting data about other things, you know? Um, like, I don't, I don't know, like nature or, or, you know, astronomy. These are different things outside of the human context. And I think that is why human rights are so important to think about when we think about data that are collected from people, because they are from people, right? They are, and that makes them fundamentally different. So I think that is a really, that's, that, that's sort of where I would, would leave that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think uh, on that note, um, I think I'll, I think the audience has more questions, and uh, I'll, I'll open it up for, for those of you who might have, you know. Uh, yes, please. Person in pink. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Hi. Uh, so I'm actually a lawyer by background as well. So I'm a uh, couple of things that you said. I just want to kind of link them and then ask the question if that's all right. Um, one thing that you spoke about was obviously um, people not being able to choose after that, and you know things happening to their data after they've passed away. Okay. Obviously, I've not read the book yet, so this is outside that. Um, what comes to mind is the question of intent. And that is something that um, I feel like as a lawyer and as a privacy lawyer especially, uh, I've been thinking about as to the data is being processed and where it's being processed is not something that's being discussed, again, coming to your stakeholder um, part as well. So what role as subjects does our intent play, and if any at all, and how do you see it proceeding? in the future. So when you say our intent, is that the data subject's intent or the data collector's intent? The subject. The subject. I mean, so, yeah, if people want to create data doubles of themselves or become digital immortals, which they can choose, to, then they should be able to do that. I, 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 like, I think that that's something that is within the realm of possibility, and this is an exercise of autonomy, right? This is kind of like when you will something to people, land or a house or money, right? So it could be part of that. We could think about it that way. Um, and already lawyers are doing that in terms of digital assets, right? You can will your digital assets to, to different friends and family if you want. I think my worry is that you cannot preserve the intent of the person given the, the stickiness of data. And so what happens if someone's, like the data that they have produced in their life is copied and then redistributed? What can you do? Right? And I don't know if you could, there's no way to know what would happen. And also is that, I don't, I don't know how we can like, think about the intent with something as, as easily transferable as digital data, as opposed to like a house or a car, right? which are more concrete assets that we can understand either the person's intent was delivered or not. Right? So I think that's one thing. I mean, I also think, you know, the intent of the, the source, the data source, is not always going to be the same as the data collector. But right now, we don't have a way to really bridge that gap if there is one. So I would say that intent is important. But because of the stickiness of data, I think we need to go beyond that. Yeah. Um, okay. Michael. Thank you very much for this very important book. Thank I'm you. really looking forward to reading it too. My question is about the right to forget. Uh -huh. The European Union, the EU regulation actually covers that. And some people say Europe is doing that because they don't have many companies. 
uh, that deal in this area and therefore they're being more restrictive. And consequently, we see that the Americans and also in Canada, we haven't done very much about the right to forget. You've talked about the immortality of data, but we wonder, should the right to forget be one of your fundamental rights? So the right to be forgotten has been around for a little while. Um, and I do talk about it in the book because it's, yeah, because it is something that has arisen and is, is something that people are actively exercising. But so the right to be forgotten, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, is basically if there's information about you on the, on the internet that's searchable, um, and you find it contrary to, to what's happening in the world or what's happening to, in your life, right? Then you, it's, let's say it's, a, um, it's not, a not uh, some sort of libel or slander or if it's like an old record that is no longer true, like you can actually exercise the right to be forgotten by demanding that Google remove it from the search results that you get. So that, that's no longer a part of the information people would get if they, let's say, Googled your name. Um, and you know, this really came about at a time when there, you know, it, it, it sort of fits in line with our concerns about misinformation out there, right? So it sounds really good, but I think in effect what's happened, again, this is a, a literacy issue, is that some people are very attuned to how they appear in search results. Some people are really aware of what, of what is out there about them, and so they ask for this information to be expunged. But if you don't know, or you don't know about that process, that information, your information about you still remains. So there is a fundamental inequality there in that realization of that right, in addition to different you know, jurisdictional questions. You're also asking a company to make that decision, which is very different from how we have come to think about human rights, which are the responsibility of states to enforce. Now, there's a whole section in my book that talks about why uh, and we didn't talk about it at all today, really, but like why it's fundamentally too limiting to think about human rights as solely the responsibility of states when we have companies like Google or Meta protecting and or preventing the realization of human rights um, for potentially billions of people. So the right to be forgotten in that way is, is really an exercise in inequality of knowledge, and maybe that'll change over time. But the other countervailing a countervailing concern is public interest. So, so how do we decide as, right now it's companies, but like as societies, what information is search relevant and what is not? And so the line has typically been public interest, but then that opens a, a different can of worms. And, I, and I, so I think I, there's no easy way to answer your question. I think one of the ways that I would like to think about this is not as a right to be forgotten, because maybe we don't want to forget things that have happened, but we want people to be forgiven for things that have happened. And so it's also adjusting our social expectations for people's perfection, right? Like, I think that nowadays, because of datafication, any mistake you make is potentially findable. But that wasn't true 20 years ago. We still have these expectations that people should be pretty pristine, and I think that's getting unrealistic. So that's a so that's more of a social, than not a non-technical question. Yeah. But I mean, also like one of the uh, the right to be for just on the point of the right to be forgotten, it's because like one of the characteristics of data that you mentioned is that it's uh, linked, right, or co-created, yeah. so that there's always some way to find this data if you know if you really have somebody who's enthusiastic enough or you know, determined enough to find yeah. it. I like right? enthusiastic, that's a good one. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of uh, feels dangerous when it's coming from a stalker. Yeah, uh, okay. that's right. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. And uh, your book is strangely very uh, timely at this, uh, given the current global events. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, what's happening right now in the Middle East, and particularly how the disinformation on both sides is really making it very hard for most people to, um, the, the, the literacy, the checking is constant on both sides. So beyond kind of the dehumanizing, like the right to dignity that you mentioned here, is kind of pushed aside on both camps. So we try to use data to, on the one hand, dehumanize, but also to create two 
two dissenting communities. So my, I guess my real question is, what is beyond data literacy? Even experts are having a really hard time now making sense of the situation, what is real data, what is wrong, what is misinformation, what is left of maybe another framework? Should it be data justice? Should it be, what, do, what is there beyond literacy? Is there such a thing and how do we, does data literacy fix kind of the lack of humanity, how we are being divided by data, by fabricated data and on both sides in this case? So, thank you. I, that's a great question. I don't know if I have a good answer to, to what you're saying because I think this is, um, it goes beyond data, right? This is, this is really how, do social, how does social media fundamentally change what we can know, right? So, and, and what we do know. And I, you know, I, I think of this as a very tumultuous period because, you know, in the beginning we saw platforms like Twitter and Facebook as really ways for people to connect and to really make connections that couldn't have been possible. It was very positive, then it became, it has become extremely negative. And I try, to, I try to analogize this to, because, it's, because these platforms are ways of exercising freedom of expression, I sort of try to think about when else have we had these dramatic changes in the way that people communicate? Right? Are there analogies we can think through? And I do think one of the ones that I find very interesting and something that I'd li I like to think about a little bit more is the analogy to journalism and how journalism also, if you think about you know, newspapers, really printing a lot of unverified facts or made up things for a long time. And then, the and then it professionalized, right? And you got people who were certified journalists who were trained in journalistic uh, techniques and methods. And you got improved, an improved sense of both the reporting and also the people doing the work uh, were you know, sort of trained to balance different views. I don't know how, and I think we're sort of thinking about this in, in real time and thinking about the different platforms now that exist that cater to different audiences, right? And I'm, I'm hopeful that at some point we'll, we'll come to a way where we realize how we can better filter out information, not just through algorithms, but through the, the social networks that use these different social media tools. I mean, I don't think data literacy is the answer. I think it is an answer because without understanding the importance of how, not just what, like understanding how your interaction with a platform shapes what you see through the data that are generated about you, filtered to an algorithm, I don't think that, I, I think that that would inhibit our understanding of the fact that there are, there's, there's fake information out there. But it's not the only way, and I do think this is why, um, not only do we have to be data literate, I think we need to, to be more open to, to, uh, to, to thinking about how we can be trained to think through critically about the information that we receive right through our various channels. So I don't think data literacy would be the answer to that, but I think it's also a, a question, again, of, of you know, people coming to the realization that, that the information that they get is not always true, and how, and how do we weed that out? Yeah. OK. Uh, yes, please. Sorry. Uh, the person with the mask, yes. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Um, oh, I think the mic is here. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations, Wendy. Looking Thank forward you. to reading the book. Uh, since we have a human rights expert in the house, my question is more about human rights. So, I'm trying to think about human rights in relation to your take-home message, which is that we should stop thinking about, about ourselves as subjects, but really think about ourselves as stakeholders to get literate over these issues. But then as someone, as a political scientist, if I have an interest in public opinion, we know that most people actually don't care about a lot of things that are happening around us. We are also not very well informed. So I wonder, like, I'm also staring at this framework, I, I'm thinking, how can this framework uh, help us move this discussion forward in terms of, say, public opinion and motivating the public to actually do something? Because in some ways, the ideas like privacy, uh, data security, it's very easy to wrap their, people's heads around those, those concepts. So uh, you, two answers ago, you alluded to there's a chapter uh, uh, in the book about that, but I just wanted to uh, ask you more about 
you know, sort of who is this human rights framework for? Uh, is this human rights framework for like sort of everybody that we can, you know, start thinking about it in, in, in this way and that can help uh, animate this uh, very much needed discussion? And the second short question I have is that you mentioned that there's a lot of anxiety going on around data and that there are also a lot of people who you uh, interact with also have a lot of anxieties. I, I'm too naive, I'm very naive to say that I'm not very anxious about this. Uh, I also wonder uh, who is most anxious about this data issue? Is it also related to literacy in some ways? Is there sort of a U-curve, let's say, that people who know most about it are most anxious uh, about that, and maybe people who are in the middle are like, you know, just blissfully uh, uh, unaware of a lot of things. So, but uh, looking forward to reading this book. Thank you. Um, I don't, you know, that's something I would actually want to ask you, right? Because of what you like, I actually want to know, like, who is most anxious? If, like, it's just, I don't systematically study public opinion on these issues, right? So that is something that it's it's an empirical question, and and I wonder about that, and so I think. People who are more, what I've seen is that people who are more informed can be more anxious about it because they do know what the implications are, right? So, so there's this sort of uh, contradiction about having more information and more knowledge leading to more anxiety and not less anxiety. But that's something, so that's something that I would love to have a conversation more about um, with you, right? And, and others who actually look at this, these, these patterns. In terms of who the framework is for, so I think it's for different for different audiences has different purposes. So, you know, for the general public, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I don't think if you ask someone for a definition of human rights from some, some a random sample that you would actually get a good definition. Yeah. That being said, I think there is a, a, a zeitgeist behind human rights that a lot of people can cling on to and, and try to hang their hat on because I think because they're, they are universal, because they hearken to this idea of protecting human potential that people can really buy into. And I think when you do ask people about human rights, a lot of times they do talk about dignity or some idea of equality or, or autonomy. Um, fewer people talk about community, but you do get the sense that people understand the values of human rights. So they may not be able to pop off a bunch of different rights or tell you what the legal definition of human rights are, right, yeah. but they can tell you what they're for. So I think this is a reminder to people that these rights, these values are still in our society. We just have, or in, in the way that humans live, it's just that our experiences of life have changed so much because of datafication. I'd more, you know, frankly, you know, it would be great if policymakers could actually treat data as something that, uh, data about human beings as something that comes from humans and to also understand the collective implications of data, not just focusing on individuals making choices, because that puts a lot of onus on all of us, and it's also just very inaccurate, given the fact that the implications for datafication are both individual but also collective. And I think that's a really, that's a big part that has been missed in this country, in the US. I think the Europeans are moving towards the idea of, okay, there are collective, um, there are collective stakes when we, when we think about data, but I think in general that's being missed, and it's not just about individual choice. So I, and I think, again, this human rights framework really helps because there's this idea of community and because human rights matter in the collective. Individuals, individual right bearers don't matter if there's no community. Um, and I, I just, I think the other way to think about this, I think is also, um, as I think the shift in language really matters. If you think that you have a stake, I think that's different from saying you don't have a stake. Similarly, if you, say, if you think of yourself as a bearer of rights or of human rights, that's a different orientation than just thinking you are a subject, right? And so I do think the language matters. I think that, that thinking of yourself as having a stake because the role of the data source is just as important as the role of the data collector in the creation of data. I think that's a really important framing shift and hopefully will we'll get people, the general public, to think harder about how they engage, what kinds of things they want companies to, to produce um, in response to this awareness of datafication. Yeah. Um, oh, Sheila, and then, yes, sir. 
Hi, Wendy. Great Hi, to see you. Um, so I have a question about about mortality, but I wanted to precede it with a with a, a, a defense of the computer scientists as a computer <laughs> scientist myself, because I, I'm afraid we're being vilified here, and I just wanted wanted to remind everyone, I guess, that computer scientists are not all one size fits all. That we are fathers and mothers, and 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 uh, you know bird watchers and gardeners and painters and musicians and all sorts of different people with very diverse opinions right. and i think it's really important to to acknowledge that and to the actually to the last speaker i would i would also conjecture that there may be some sort of a u curve with respect to the concern about data and that computer scientists, you know, the, the conversation has become a public conversation in the last little while, particularly with ChatGPT, making making AI technology available to everybody. So everybody's aware or can imagine its its impact. But I think many computer scientists have been aware of that and having conversations about it for a long Absolutely. time. Yes. And that people who are working in those tech companies are also having conversations about it as well. You know, absolutely, it's the case that, that they're informed by, you know, working for a large corporation that is that is profit motivated. But but beyond that, I you know I think there are a lot of thoughtful people. But I completely agree with your your comment about the fact that I think it's important for all of us to be educated in in what others are doing. And indeed, you know, the embedded ethics program at the Schwartz Reisman Institute was designed precisely to sort of endow students with perspective and the knowledge and skills to sort of appreciate the impact of what they're doing now that now that it's having such a big impact on on society and on on people's lives. So, so yeah. So I, I think we agree on that. Anyways, so after that monologue, um, I'll ask you my question, which is, and and I think I've asked you a version of this before, but you know, I think that that, that data, and I think you, I, I'm really looking forward to your book, and Thank uh, you. looking forward to you getting you to sign it. Um, data's existed in some in different forms for a very long time. I mean, we just only need to go to our libraries exactly. here and to look at the, so many of the written, the digital, the the non-digital, but paper artifacts that yep. exist, the art, the books. The, the buildings that, that people study. And so, and, and, it, and scholars, university scholars used to spend their lives <coughs> poring over the writings of previous scholars and yep. studying them and analyzing them and manipulating them and reinterpreting them. And, and, I, and you know, I think about Eleanor Roosevelt's private letters mm -hmm. that have been analyzed yep. and, and people have, have, you know, and, and I wonder, I guess I have two questions. One, the first question is, is whether we will, re, you know, in the context of thinking about those things as data and thinking about human rights, where, whether we will, we will bring into question what we as human beings are doing and have been doing for, for centuries with respect to academic, um, with respect to our academic pursuits and, and studying and interpreting artifacts of other people, like, like Eleanor Roosevelt's um, letters or, or Sylvia Plath's writing and, and what it meant about her psychological state or various other things that are, that are in some ways very private things and, and speak to, I think, some of these pillars that, that, that you've been discussing. Um, the other thing, uh, yeah, and maybe, maybe I'll just pause for a minute and, and ask you about that and, and then I'll, I'll ask a, a second part if that's okay. Okay, yeah, and you, you have asked me, I'm gonna, hopefully this answer will be better. And actually, Sheila, when I was talking about ethics in computer science programs, I was looking at you because I do actually talk about you, you know, the work at U of T that you've done. Yeah. Um, and I think it could be done more broadly, right? Yeah, and it, and it could be required, you know, Casey, Casey Feisler has this great list of tech ethics courses that are, you know, global now. And, but and also notes, like, a lot of these are not required courses in technical fields, right? They are available, but they are elective. I think that the key is to, to really make them mandatory and to really make them part of the core curriculum. Exactly. Because I was looking at you, but I didn't say your name. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> In defense of I, myself. Oh, yeah, no, 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 I wasn't criticizing. I knew, I knew you knew about it. You, yeah, you exactly. I mean, we've talked about it. And, else, I, yeah. and, I, and I think, you know, I don't want to paint computer scientists with a broad brush of nefariousness. That's not what I meant to do. But it is, you know, we are oriented towards data very d differently. And I think that actually came out a lot in our research lead conversations. So I learned a lot from you and, and David in that regard. Um, OK. So you have asked me the question about data existing, and I think the big difference is, is in terms of the everydayness. So your point out Eleanor Roosevelt, Sylvia Plath, these are well-known public figures. 
And I think for a long time, we knew what we, we as a human societies gathered information about well-known people. Well-known people are well-studied, you're right, academic, whole academic disciplines are around you know, lo knowing details about the lives of important, influential, or, or famous people. But do we give up our, did, did Eleanor Roosevelt give up her rights to privacy? But I mean, maybe she's a, she's a, she was the president's wife, but. But, no, but that's what yeah. I mean, like there's a, there's a publicness to her, right? And, and I think, you know, I, I, what is different now is that now all of our, all of us have that sort of, potential to be really examined very closely through the data that we're shedding, through the data that are about us. And because we don't know where those data are going, we really don't know who or what is looking at it in the case of algorithmic analysis, right? So I think the big change is the types of, the, the amount of information available about everyone as opposed to some people. Now you can make arguments about whether it's appropriate to look at you know, private correspondence with uh, public figures, right? And there, you know, I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt's one, there was, there was a study a while ago about Abraham Lincoln and some of his private correspondence and people were talking about his sexual orientation. And so, you know, th there are a lot of these questions, I think, that used to revolve around certain people or certain figures and now potentially could be about everybody. I think that's the big shift in the human experience, is actually having all these data about everyone who's alive today going forward. And so the selectivity of the data that are collected over time has become less selective. And I think that's really the big difference. It's the mundaneness, it's the granularity of what we know about people, and it's the fact that it's about everyone. Yeah, so I, I wondered whether, I'll, I, I'll cede the floor to somebody else, but I wondered whether it was about an algorithm doing an, the analysis versus a human being. That it's okay for a human being to, you know, nobody knows where things that are accessible in the library can be taken out by anybody. Um, and, and once they're, and, and they're also, and there are, there are also, we study regular people as well mm -hmm. as famous people, and we wanted to know, you know what women's lives were like in the, the, the 18th century, women working on farms or various other people. I mean, there's, there's information about right, all sorts true. of people, not yeah. just famous yeah, people. It's true. available in the library. We don't control who looks at it. Certainly they don't know who's looking at it because they're dead. Um, but but, but I, I wonder whether the difference is really about, about whether an, an algorithm is manipulating it versus whether a human being is studying it. And I think, I mean, it, it feels to me like there's a continuum and it's not exactly clear to me whether, whether we can draw the line at, 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 at some point or not and whether we won't at some point, rightly or wrongly so, go back and reflect on what academics are doing with respect to analyzing other people's data and pull that into question as part of this, this human rights. Um, yeah. Anyways. No, that, no, I think that's a really good point. And, and this, you know, I should have said this. I mean, yes, social historians, for example, are not just looking at really well-known people. On the other hand, their data access is limited by who, whose, whose records are being kept. So there's still a filtering process that is not, it, it, I think the, there's still a filtering process for whose data get preserved over time, which sometimes is beyond anyone's control. Um, and we know, but there's a bias towards certain types of people's information being preserved over time rather than others, like marginalized groups, you know, rarely have their information preserved in the same way historically, um, and even now, and I think that is something to keep in mind, right? That there is now less of a filtering mechanism, and I think, the, again, the activities are more granular. They're more every day, minute by minute, second by second, as opposed to like diaries or letters or record keeping or wh whatever it is that, that historians have really used to draw their inferences from in, the, um, in their work. Um, as to the human versus algorithm, I don't, I think that, so part of my, my uh, I think there's a tension there, right, because I think it really, creates a dichotomy between human beings and algorithms. And I really want us to remember that algorithms are made by human beings for intention. So is it algorithm versus human? Or is it something, else? is it automation? Like I don't know and I think it'd be great if we could have a chat about this because I, I actually don't know and I, and I don't want to say it's algorithm versus human because I, I actually think part of the problem with the whole conversation around AI, whether it's killer robots or not, 
is the, the problem that we have separated the humanity and the human ingenuity behind AI and behind datafication, when in fact these are very human creations and human technologies, and their intent, therefore, should be oriented towards human, I would guess, betterment, right? Or at least not harming fundamental human rights. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Wendy and Anna. This was a great conversation. So, um, when you mentioned more than once the importance of uh, seeing the humans behind the data as a different way to perceive what data are and how this can change how we see privacy and other and other issues, so one market-based approach uh, that goes in that direction, and some scholars have uh, uh, advanced, is to treat data not as assets, but as labor. And so the producers of data as you know, doing some tasks that needs to be remunerated. And the idea behind this is that this would create a market. Yep. And so one, people might be more careful about the data they share because there may be a different price, so better data, and that might make also the algorithms that use this data better and so on and so forth. And second, this might address, I don't want to say solve, the collective action problem because as you make us laborers, then you might have uh, data producer unions uh, to the extreme. Yep. And so there may be more of an incentive to pay attention and to share the activity with others and have your rights or some of your rights more, uh, more protected. So I was wondering what you think about it. And very briefly, since uh, you mentioned the importance of having ethics courses in technical fields, uh, I, I couldn't agree more, and I would go actually a step for, uh, further. Uh, my fear, maybe I'm pessimistic, is that if you have an ethics course, even if it's uh, mandatory, many could, could see it as the easy class to do at the very end and not care about it. Technology is so important in our life that I would have an ethics module in each and every class people take in any major uh, and so on. So. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, we got to talk to Sheila about that, right? <laughs> but like, I think there should be an ethics sequence or some sort of social science humanities sequence. It's not just the easy class, right? And maybe they could just find the meanest prof to teach those classes. I don't know, right? Um, create some fear. But um, you know, to your question, I think, I think labor unions, I think labor collect, or, sorry, data unions and data collectives are exactly moving in the right direction. My concern with the way it's being characterized now is that it's purely market driven. And we all know that labor unions and, and collectivities are not just fi economic arrangements, they're also ID identity, they're social, they're political, and they can be cultural. And I think adopting a more human, humanity focused view of data would go beyond that, right? It's not just about trading data. In fact, I don't, even, I don't, I don't know if monetizing data is actually the way to go. Um, I have skepticism around that. But I think it's about access, it's about the creation of data, it's about the uses of data, and, and potentially groups like data unions could fight for norms that are arising or emerging, like data minimization, right? which is this idea that you don't collect all the data you can, you collect the data you need. And so how do you know what you need? I mean, that's something data unions could negotiate. And, and so I, I think what you're saying, I, I absolutely agree. Like I think the way that it's been talked about um, is in fact very economic. I, and, and I think that's part of the rejection of this idea of, of data as, as something that is only about markets or it's only about property and insofar as property rights, whether I can gain or not from them. So, so getting paid for data. And, and so actually Jamie and I are working on these ideas, he's sitting right behind you. Um, we're thinking about how we can think about data collectivities and data unions as going beyond the market because if we continue to think about data as marketizable, as commodities, we're not gonna get very far. I mean, human rights are not about the market. They're non-market goods, right? And we don't trade human rights on the market because they don't have value in the monetary sense. And I think we need to start thinking about data as beyond markets. Okay, that's, uh, that's, um, on that note, uh, we're going to end the, uh, the formal Q&A portion of this. Um, I would like to turn it over to Monique, who might have some words for us at this point. But for, all, for, some, of, for some of you who might still have burning questions, uh, you know, like I, I know that uh, you can stay for a bit and um, 
ask Wendy some of these questions. Thank but, you. Wendy? So Anna and Wendy, thank you both for such an engaging discussion. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and joining us this afternoon as well. Um, we invite you to make your way into the reception area and I want to let you know that Wendy will, st uh, will stay seated here at, the, at the front um, if you want to get your book signed by her in the next few minutes. Again, if you haven't purchased a copy of the book and you would like to do so, you can just check at the front at the registration desk and staff can help you with that. Finally, if you enjoyed today's event, we invite you to take a look at the schwartz Reisman Institute website or follow us on social media where you can learn more about um, our programming, our research, um, and what's going on here at U of T and beyond on these topics. Thank you, everyone.